Hero Club presents Los Inglobanables de Tokusatsu. Welcome to Los Inglobanables de Tokusatsu, episode 76. I am your host and one of the original co-creators of this show, Wheelchair21. And tonight's show is going to be jam-packed with us doing the post-mortem of the Saban and Bandai of America era of Power Rangers, as well as the recent New York Toy Fair. But before we get into all that, let me introduce to you my co-hosts at this time is none other than the official fourth member of the podcast, Sound Out 12. Sorry, drooling over Die Rugger pictures, because these 15 vehicles got me too excited. And also joining us is the fifth man of... Hero Club's first original podcast. It's none other than the man who runs Ninja Talks Gundam and Ninja Talks Tokusatsu. It is the Visible Ninja Metal Symphony. Haha, now with advertising bumpers. Yay. Yes, you'll see more about those probably more often than just the last episode. You'll probably see it in this episode, maybe. You'll probably see it in uh-huh. the next episode. Who knows? We'll find out in the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. Dun 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 dun. Anyways, so like we said, this is going to be a post-mortem episode for Saban, which actually ends up being a happy accident due to scheduling conflictions, because, you know, we ended up right on the cusp of New York Toy Fair upon recording this episode, which is a little too ironic, seeing that also the man who came up with this crazy-ass idea is the one and only heavy breather himself. Damn straight. Yeah, so, no, it was actually interesting that Metal came up with this idea back in, like, I think early December, and then due to conflict and scheduling, we just got, like, so sidetracked with all the original pre-planned stuff. No, I think we were trying to hold off till at least the Christmas episode aired, but then it delayed in Canada, right? Yeah. Like, Canada always gets delayed for some reason, like a week and a half after it actually naturally airs. Yeah. And, like, that led to us not doing it. But anyways, uh, when it comes to this post-mortem, I guess the best way to do this kind of faux pas eulogy is just, in a sense, discuss what went wrong. With the Neo Saban era, what went wrong with Bandai, even during Disney to now? Like, there was a lot of mistakes made since, you know, at least on Ban- Bandai of America's part. Since I was Let's say, not use the word mistakes. Let's use the word missteps. I guess, yeah, missteps. Since missteps I'll, is more accurate. Because yeah, we had missteps since Operation Overdrive. Then once Saban took it back in, you know, uh, the post-RPM era, which was like 2009-2010, things just went even more crazy since Saban did achieve some success, but then it just, like, exploded then again in his face. So it's it's really interesting. Like, I, I don't even know where, where we should actually probably start outside of just saying that we know where it started, we know how it started, but, you know, it's it's one of those things of what is the best place to start, really, Santa? Where, where do you think we need to truly begin? Uh, should we start? At the moment that I thought Bandai, like, going back through their history, Bandai of America's history with Power Rangers, and I think the moment things shifted towards kind of where the slip-off point happened, it's not necessarily that, like, the quality and such just dropped off, but more like it's where it started was Operation Overdrive creating their own Megazord molds. Yeah, no. Because, that, yeah. That's probably the, the real stepping stone, because... I think what necessarily also hurt Saban was the fact that Bandai of America did change a lot when he got the brand back. And it didn't, you know what I'm saying? It didn't help that he was trying to recapture lightning in a bottle. But Bandai did take the initial first step to, to where we got to now because we had the operation. Let's do a brief course. recap. Let's do, right. do a re- brief recap and why I say overdrive is the slipping. Cause I think it's important to have the context for this. Yeah, we really do because it, trickles it really does trickle into the following seasons yes uh so mighty morphin comes over to the united states we we, you know mighty morphin's created from g ranger bandai of america takes you know the blade blaster the power morpher the megazords the eight inch figures i think or am i wrong anyways they bring a bunch of stuff i don't think the eight inches i don't think the eight inches because they did eight inches later in japan yeah no they took the it was the vehicle figures that they brought over like the vehicle figures yes and the vehicles themselves so they, they brought over several molds from Japan, 
And that was like the original lineup, I think, was just a Japanese mold for the most part, and then eight inch figures that they made. Uh, and as the line progressed, they would mix in like, okay, so we're going to throw in this, you know, five inch assortment of monsters and rangers. It's all new figures that Band of America was making. So they kind of were just producing figures and maybe some new vehicles, but they were bringing, uh, you know, majority of their lines were coming from Japan for morphers and megazords and role play items. We start going forward in time. I mean, originally, when they started, there was Japanese molds. Uh, I think a different quality of plastic. I don't have a Daijujin to compare to a Mighty Morphin Megazord. But the stickers were different. Obviously, some details were changed. And as the years went on, the Megazord started to lose paint apps, uh, started to lose some other details. Uh, I think that it was around, let's see, like Lost Galaxy. Uh, the Galaxy Megazord had less die casts than Gingayo, but they also released Gingayo at FAO Schwartz at the same time. Uh, for kind of more collector purposes, I guess. And then I think it was around the time of Time Force was when we lost paint apps. And then Wild Force, we lost die cast and paint apps. We got to Ninja Storm and we lost all the die cast. And that means that they were creating mold, they were creating toys that were intended for a Japanese, the Japanese mold was designed for die cast parts. The American release did not have die cast parts and had a lower quality plastic which resulted in uh, fragility years down the line. That trend continued into Dino Thunder, where, uh, well, actually, going stepping back a little bit, Wild Force's morphers were not the same as their Japanese counterparts. They removed features such as the brace and the interchangeable heads. Uh, you go forward to Ninja Storm, things lost chrome. They changed size. They were starting to make new molds for morphers that were similar to the Japanese ones, but not quite. You know, Dino Thunder, SPD... Mystic Force, Japanese molds, less paint quality. There were missing Zords that weren't released during those years. Uh, morphers were similar but different. In the case of SPD and Mystic Force, they were shrunk down versions that removed features. And so we kind of built up to this point where it got to Overdrive, where Bandai decided to ditch the Japanese Megazords completely. By that point, they'd already ditched Japanese molds for Morphers. And the only consistent thing that they've done over the years was the action figure assortments. So I think that, personally, I'm looking at the history of Bandai, when they dropped the Japanese molds, that was not just a thing that they were doing out of the blue. They, I think it was progressively getting there, because I think the cost of releasing the Japanese mold Megazords over here to America was getting higher, and they kept having to raise prices, and they decided, all right, we're not raising prices anymore, we're just going to drop the quality and make our own molds. And... You know, the Overdrive Zords are larger than the Daiboken counterparts, but they are significantly less intricate, significantly less detailed. And so that allowed them to be the same price as the previous year's stuff, but it did have a drop in quality. And I think that, you know, as we went forward through Overdrive and Jungle Fury, we still had some Japanese molds released, the Zuban and Dive Voyager came over. We got the main two Megazords from Geki Ranger, which was Geki Tocha and Geki Fire, as well as Disney Store releases of Sidio, Lion, and Chameleon. So we got some of the Japanese molds brought over, but then others were the rest of the main Megazord line ended up being Band of America's new molds. And by RPM, all Japanese molds were dropped completely from the line. Everything was Bandai created on their own. And kind of from there, I think there, that was, RPM was kind of the slipping point where everything kind of slid off in quality to the point where we got to Ninja Steel where that was absolutely not acceptable under any means. Yeah, so like that's where Saban comes in and is like, hey guys, I just bought back the franchise from Disney who were trying to kill it. And at that time, I remember like, People were more scratching their heads in shock and surprise, and I think that's what made fans happy. Like, Visible Ninja, what was your thoughts on the turn of the tide of, you know, Saban reinterjecting oh, himself Lord. into this? Okay, I remember, I remember the day it happened. Because, again, at the time, you know, things were kind of not feeling great in the Power Rangers fandom. You know, RPM had, you know, wound up. It was... You know, it still is a bit of a divisive series, but the series it, was officially canceled, though. Let's remember, yeah, there wasn't official. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it was officially shuttered, closed up. You know, they 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 ceased any and all production and any all plans for production there in New Zealand. It was, for all intents and purposes, dead. And you know, after the kind of travesty, I guess you could say, that was uh, MMPR 2010, which was made to fulfill a toy contract with Bandai. Yeah. 
And let's just say the the trope, the fandom rejoiced, does not even begin to, I guess, describe how everybody was feeling when the news of, you know, Saban buying it back and that Disney had failed to, like, properly, like, you know, realize and merchandise the franchise and everything. Let's just say the, the entire internet practically exploded. Well, not the entire internet. Let's just say, yeah, uh, fan discourse was at an all-time high, I think. But in hindsight, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Samurai, like, e- like even in hindsight, like, a lot of people have even, like, 100% confirmed that Samurai was pretty much rushed into production after Saban bought back the rights. Like, it, it, it went from essentially buying back the franchise to debuting Samurai all within six months. Which is probably part of the reason why Samurai, uh, especially the first season, was pretty much just a copy-paste of Shinkanger. Just because it had to be rushed into production so quickly to, to get a TV show out there. It, it, it just didn't work. The, like, the toys themselves, uh, like Sound Out elaborated, were all 100% Bandai of America. The Samurai toys actually weren't that bad. Like, they weren't, you know, Japanese molds or anything, but with a few exceptions with, like, missing, you know, features that the Japanese toys had that these ones didn't, it missing was overall... Missing the gimmick entirely. Yeah, like, the whole, like, heat and disc thing. But, like, like mecha-wise, it wasn't, like, obviously, like I said, there was neutered gimmicks and everything, but, like, as a whole, they weren't bad. And then, you know, the figures and everything with the new, the brand new, you know, American-only, you know, mega modes, which... I think was actually kind of a good idea on his part. Well, because it meant that they had to reshoot all the cockpit footage. And I can kind of see why, because of how Japanese-y, you know, the inside of Shinkano is. So I guess they figured they needed something a little more techno, you know what I mean? Would you like to hear my theory about the Mega Modes? Sure. I don't think that was a Saban idea. Oh, it was a Bandai idea? I think it was a Bandai idea because uh, at the time we had MMPR 2010, which (laughs) was a failure. And, (laughs) yeah, and the thing is, the Samurai toys came out instantly, which said, and because the first wave of figures was the Mega Mode and not the regular modes, which would have made sense, says to me that Bandai designed the first batch of Samurai toys with the intention that there wasn't going to be a TV show, but that they were going to continue making Power Rangers toys based on Sentai materials. And then Saban took it. Yeah, because otherwise, I don't see any other reason why they would have put I've, out Mega I, Mode first. I know I've definitely, I, like, I haven't seen it definitely confirmed, but I have heard the rumors is that Bandai was just going to continue the toy line anyway. Uh, but uh, that's part of the reason why when they morph, they get, like, the, the mask things or whatever, like, over their faces before, like, the helmets form and everything. Which matches the Automorphin figures. Yeah, because, yeah, the Automorph, because they wouldn't have, you know, because there wasn't going to be a show, so they wouldn't have, like, you know, actor, like, heads or likenesses or whatever, so they just did that. Because let's remember, Bandai did good, they didn't skip a beat. Because they were already designed. Yeah, no, one of the things they were trying to do, too, was, uh, allegedly, they were trying to shop around to try to just make it, like, comic book cartoon material and turn it into, like, a G.I. Joe kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and you look at it, it's like Bandai didn't skip a beat between uh, MMPR 2010 and Samurai. Like, those toys came out fast, which is yeah. why I say that I don't think they they had enough lead time to develop a whole new line. I think yeah, they were going to do it which is, Yeah, like you said, why they just threw out the Mega Modes and then did the proper, like, Shinkanger designs, you know, in, like, later waves was because of that. So. Yeah, and then Honestly, Saban I was like, it. let's I make a cockpit it. mode so we don't have to use the cockpit footage. Yeah, I believe it. And then there's Super Samurai, which was more the same, slightly more originality, but still pretty copy-paste. Like, like there was a few more kernels of, like, like original, like, footage and original kind of diverging from Shankanger, but it didn't, like, do it overly much. A lot of it was just to avoid the Juzo murdering an entire town storyline. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and some of the other more violent stuff in the show. And, you know, Kevin being the one to kill Juzo. Ah. That was really a weirdly dishonorable death for Juzo. Or yeah. At least death her. And then you yeah. have the whole thing where they switched out instead of having, you know, Kevin kill Xandred before he grows into his final form. They just leave it down to, let's use the Mega Mode Battleizer as an actual thing. Yeah. Shogun, Shogun mode. yeah, actually out of cockpit for once. 
And only once. Which is funny, because what is it? Everybody except Emily got to use it, if I remember right. I think it was, yeah, it was gold and, no, green as well. Oh, yeah, green, I, yeah, green I think and yellow. only red, blue, and pink. Only half the team used that yeah, mode. Yeah, red, blue. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think. I was like, I know Emily, you know, uh, yellow didn't use it. But, yeah, come to think of it, yeah, yeah, green didn't use it either. And then also to that extent, uh, gold got a toy of it. They never made a small. Oh, yeah, show. I remember because like, yeah, big, red, blue, yeah. and gold got toys of of Shogun mode, but yeah, gold never got it in show. But there were designs for yellow and green, and presumably suits made as well because there was promotional images in the show. They have like a shot of like well, all as those for the uh, suit. Shogun that, modes. Well, as for the suit, as as we see behind the scenes, they only had the red suit, and they just color color shifted it to the other colors. So yeah. There were some color. cool post-production stuff in Neo Saban. I gotta give him credit there. Like you said, with the shifting colors of the suits, in Mega Force, they remove an entire Zord from existence. Yeah, they remove Data's hyper completely. Like, he's gone in, like, you know, er- it's obvious he's well, gone. It's, it's a funny gap, thing, because but... that leads to some, some shots looking kind of weird, because, like, it's not centered on, like, go, go, you know, go say great. It's because he's, like, off to the left, and then there's just, like, nothing beside him. When, but if you yeah, never knew that there was supposed was to be another robot there, you'd just be like, oh, they just have him off to that side. Yeah, and how they did it in the toys is weird, too, because... Because, like, the header sets, you know, came on these, like, vehicles that you got a little, like, shitty little figure to, like, ride on. And then, like, you, you take the, the three vehicles from the three header sets and they would, like, combine into this, like, ungainly, like, antler Yellow kind button. of thing. Yeah, which you'd, like, plug the headers into and then you'd plug it into the back of Go Say Great. And, and it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of shitty, but... I think what was crap was the fact that they split up uh, Go Say Grand. I, it did provide Gose Grand having the most paint apps, I think, of any, like, That's true. Yeah, Bond Grand era Bandai next door. And it's interesting, because they actually gave the uh, the hyper header, like, a body. Yeah, and a motorcycle. They made those motorcycles. I thought that was kind of a unique thing, though, is that they took the idea from mm-hmm. Dino Thunder, where they released a two-pack of two Zords, and then had, like, a little harness thing that would clip on so you could put a figure on it. So it was, oh, it's a vehicle two-pack. And yet they didn't use that for, like, Ninja Steel. Yeah, cause it, cause they did it and it sort of worked for Mega Force. We got all those Zords out in one year? Yeah. <laughs> and they did it for Super Mega Force as well, and then they just dropped and the speaking idea. Speaking of, oh yeah, I guess. We Super should talk about, yeah, Mega Force and the TV show. The problem with the show at this point was they were forced, they really forced themselves into a corner because they're like, well, we're adapting regular Mega Force. And then they started building up a storyline with Troy, which had, what was it, footage of the legendary war, which foreshadowed Go Kyger. And it was like, what the hell are you guys doing? And then the yeah, Ranger they, Keys were in the command center. And then they, they like made, made the, the they announcement. Ranger Keys. They were like weird little statues that were sort of looked like Ranger Keys, but they weren't. But then they were. And then they were like, surprise, Super Mega Force is a, a or a Gokaiger is going to be an upgrade for Gosager. And then everyone lost their damn minds. Oh, God. Yeah, that whole thing was just a complete crap I think joke. that's where it literally led for people losing faith temporarily yet again. Because like with Samurai, people were like a little hesitant. And then Mega Force, they were like, oh, uh, and then they were, like, seeing parts of Mega Force, and they're like, uh, it's still not that good. And then, you know, comes in the Gokaiger footage, and it just, it led to terrible insanity, all because Tazakar and Saban didn't give a fuck. I think that's just the general third line, is that uh when it comes to Power Rangers and the Neo Saban era, there was just seemed like a distinct lack of care to make a good show. They just kept it to a budget, they decided... You know what? It, kids don't care. We'll just slap this together. Even though when they came back as Saban, they were like, oh, the fandom, the adult Power Rangers fans, you've been neglected by Disney. We're here. We'll make stuff for you. Look at the legacy line. Look at this. But then the show and media they're putting out was still like below five year old, like targeted media. Like nothing was taken seriously. That was, yeah, that was a major it. thing. Is that Saban kind of. I don't know if it was Saban himself or the other people who were handling the property. Like Jekyll, mostly. Yeah, but I know uh, from what the actors have said, especially the samurai actors, that they were directed to like deliver their lines as if they were speaking to like three or four year olds. You know, speak kind of. Not to slow. mention the scripting's the same way. Yeah, kind of speak very clearly, uh, very simply, like almost almost condescending. 
condescendingly. It's like they're talking down to the audience. Yeah, because, like, talk as if you're talking to, like, preschoolers, as opposed to, like you said, Power Rangers' traditional group of, like, 6 to 12-year-old boys. And the thing, the problem with that, essentially, is that because they're talking, basically they've been directed into, and they're, they're, you know, their scripting is the same way, uh, is that you're talking down to your audience. It doesn't matter what age you are. You don't want to watch something where they're talking down to you the whole time. Because then you're just watching people that think they're better than you saying that, you know, like, you know, that feeling of being talked down to doesn't give anybody good confidence. That's why the ratings have slipped off over the years. Like, it's, it's funny, the too. Is why like, even sorry. kids aren't watching as much anymore. Right. Like, it's funny, too, because, like, I didn't feel like they were talking down. I, I thought they were, like, they were just talking, not in a sense talking down, but it was like they were just talking to Koi was like it was like the like as you say it was for like kids in preschool is where even though it's like talking down it doesn't seem like too talking down it just looked like it was like a bare bones b budget style where it was like no one C-budget. knew yeah it was like no one knew what the hell they were talking about cuz unfortunately a lot of this rides with a lot of what's his face's delivery as Kevin, where, like, he has, like, these weird, like, pauses and, like, this weird tone to his voice where he's, like, he would be, like, uh, what, what was the Red Ranger's name again? Jaden. He'd be, like, Jaden. Yeah. He'd be, like, Jaden, I cannot Pause. believe. Yeah, he'd be, like, I, I cannot believe you would do such oh, a thing. God. Like, go out and, and, and the, yeah, you know, that like, he's... Her alone. And, like, he had, like, he had such of this fake theater faux pas that was really mm-hmm. hilarious. And then, like... Which is funny, yeah. And like, but it's also the scripting. The script is incredibly basic, and there's nothing for these actors to work with. Like, I've seen these actors and other things, and they have a lot of dynamic range. It's just the way that the script and directing is done is to be very straightforward, simple, basic. There is no variety. It's either happy or angry. Those are the two things they get. It's funny because all the girls, whether it be from the Samurai cast to the Megaforce cast, they felt like they were like. PBS shunoffs because of how like not just because of how cutesy wootsy or how attractive they looked but it was more like how like even their voices were like it literally sounded like they came off of the set of something like you would have your kids watch on PBS you know what I'm saying and here's but the thing it was just too. weird I give Samurai the benefit of the doubt that was a super rush production they probably didn't have any rehearsal time yeah but by Megaforce that should have been sussed out and moved away, but I think it was even worse in Megaforce. Oh, it's even stated because the Megaforce oh. cast said like they had such bad direction. There's a joke between the cast by saying Gia, uh, in a sense, flirts with every guy and <laughs> and Christina Masterson's character. What was it, Emma? They were like, Emma, they were yeah. like, they were like, we didn't know what was going on with Gia. We thought that Gia was a swinger. Yeah, the thing is that the actors didn't know their characters, and when an actor doesn't know their character. How are they supposed to portray them? And that's the thing that was the biggest hindrance of Samurai and Megaforce. But it seemed to be something that kind of sort of went away in Dino Charge. Yeah, because Dino Charge was, like, actually weird because it was like, they were like, okay, so we're bringing back Judd Lin, and Judd Lin comes in, and they get actually, like, a lot of these actors who felt confident, uh, who felt like with Judd working with them, they had a direction, they knew what was going on. This they time they had subsidiaries act- from the New Zealand government to fund yeah. the production so they'd have a higher budget. They had a higher budget. They actually had at least a couple of actors on the show that actually watched Power Rangers growing up, like actually legitimately watched Power Rangers. <laughs> So that it wasn't it's just funny. like really I think Dino in. Charge was the first cast where the answer was, "What season did you watch when growing up?" And the answer wasn't Mighty Morphin for everybody. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we finally got to the Zeo kids. Oh yeah, no, it was like it was because it was like with Yoshi, he was like, "I've been watching like all of them because I'm Asian." Like that was like Yoshi's best excuse. Like I'm Asian. I watched this and Tokusatsu. And everyone was like, "Okay, he passed." But a major is like, "Yeah, I watched Tokusatsu because Yoshi made me watch it because we all trained together." And like the others were like. Oh, yeah, no, I've seen this. I saw that. And then, like, one of them, like, what was it, from New Zealand? I just saw whatever was on Netflix. I was like, it's okay. You're, you're okay. Yeah, it's like, it didn't air in your country. It's all right. It's all right. You get a pass. You, you're a pass. But you... But the actors were really solid for Dino Charge. It was a really good cast, and I think that their scripting was much better because Judd Lynn wrote most of the episodes. Yeah, but then he was forced to bring on other writers in, in Super Dino Charge, and that show went fucking... What happened to I, that show? It was like it was like someone it was like someone came in and was like, Judge, you're going over budget again. Mm-mm, 
slap him in the back of the head. And you're not going to hard second half of Lost Galaxy, Galaxy where they're like, you're making our company bankrupt. Stop it. Yeah, it was literally, it was <laughs> literally like Lost Galaxy. Galaxy is, though, when you really think about it, Power Rangers did have the money to put into these shows. It's just Saban liked to only sequester so much of his fortune towards TV production. It's like, and, and this yeah. is the budget they put in. Not like the franchise has made more money, we're going to up the budget. No, that is the budget, and it's never changing. And this is the funniest part about this, which a lot of people don't forget, is this was the one year where Bandai of America, like the two years, Bandai of America was like, oh, yeah, by now you already expect no Japanese molds. But look at all these incredible figure assortments. Look at all these mechas. Look at these American exclusive ones. The only F-up they did was how they released Boon Pocky, you know, the actual... uh uh, that was a distribution Mace issue. That that was a di- one. Yes, it was a distribution issue. But that was like the only issue in the entire line. Like everyone was happy with their their Koyuger stuff as, as Bandai of America. Now this was before mass Power Ranger fans even knew that the Bandai toys were slightly fragile, depending on which one you got. Because like Plezua wasn't as fragile, but the first two were. You know. To, right. And the, the thing is, though, is that essentially Bandai of America took. Kyoru Yuju's designs, they stripped the electronics, they shrunk them down a bit, they reworked a bit of the engineering, and suddenly they made them not incredibly fragile, like the Japanese equivalents were, which was awesome, because that made them essentially better to have in the long term. Oh, yeah, because they had a different uh, connection system. That I think, like, I think the only thing... Didn't use the uh, bat, didn't use the Judenryu, so yeah. Like, I think the only thing that did hurt the toy line was just the actual uh, deluxe roleplay. Because I remember a lot of kids and a lot of uh, even collectors said, if you really want something that's fun, just go out and spend the extra 20 bucks to get a Gabba revolver. Yeah, and that's the thing, is that the price of the Morpher wasn't far enough off from the Japanese price to make it where it's like, oh, the American one's a lot cheaper. It's like, oh, you could just spend a little bit more and get this much nicer toy. But the yeah, thing is, overall, where spending more was a little bit better. But like they, they Band- this time, was a Dino good Charge, two years. Yes, yeah, Dino Charge was like the only time where like it felt like they hit this groove, and then all of a sudden, it was like someone just came. It, it literally is like, what would be the best way? It's like when Stewie is like, "Yo, where's my money?" Like out of nowhere, just like a baseball bat to the knee, and then they just started pounding the piss out of out of like Judd Lynn and the rest of the production team. And what, next what thing really, you see, you have to steal. What it really feels like to me, just to keep it Power Rangers relevant, is that Dino Charge and Dino Supercharge, for the most part, had a solid show with a solid toy line. We finally hit that wonderful sweet spot that I think Neo Saban was looking for for four years. Like we, we landed it for two years, and then it all fell apart in Ninja Steel. It's kind of like in Power Rangers Lost Galaxy when they finally escaped the Lost Galaxy. And like, all right. Everything's great. And then Shakina is there and starts blasting him with the Scorpion Stinger ship, and they're like, all right, shit, everything's falling apart again. No, that's kind of what happened, because, like, as soon as we go into Ninja Steel, they get a bunch of actors who actually they got together this time. Like, they weren't really no-name, no-names. Like, like, like they at least were known on independent circuits for being stunt, actual stunt actors and choreography. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they and at other, least had a, other uh, professions, too. Yeah, other professions to at least Thanks, solidify please. that they could do the, the actual practical stunts on scene. But then they were like, okay, so we got a bunch of people. We got one guy, one guy who's the brother of the other guy from the previous show. And then they kind of did nothing, like, for these actors. Like, they didn't do any practical stunts. They they tried to do a lot of new original footage, and it kind of backfired in their face. Like, I don't know, was it because they were afraid that, oh, we did something that was too Japanese a while back, that we have to do something that isn't too Japanese with Japanese material? And I feel like that's maybe what screwed them up, was they were afraid they couldn't play play safe with this one, or they, or they just didn't know how to make an original show with this one, because, don't forget, uh, I forget what was it Greg said even going into into it but by the time he had left during like late Dino Charge he even stated that like Ninja Steel they didn't even want to touch Ninja Steel they didn't want to touch Choki Uger they didn't even really want to touch Juoger too much and like they, they were, were just, stuck like, in a position afraid. where they had three pretty mediocre Sentai lines and they weren't sure how to adapt any of them and so I feel like Saban made the decision oh well ninjas are popular so let's pick the ninja one. They probably would have had a better run with Juo Drew, I think. And I think it's one of the biggest problems... Just, just cause. Like, is, it just is, had a more yeah. solid line. But like, one of the some... issues with New Ninja, and sorry, I, the, one of the issues with New Ninja is that the line is inconsistent. It doesn't have a consistent That's theme. That's what I wanted sure. to say. Thank you. Yeah. The theme is not ninjas. The theme is stuff. It's just stuff. Like, mecha-wise, there's an elephant, a UFO, a surfer, a dinosaur, construction vehicle, a train, a dog... A bull, a bull rider, a ninja guy, a dragon, a giant lion, 
and then six nondescript Japanese animals that are roughly marine based that look just weird because they're constantly on fire. There's nothing in that line that's consistent. The only ninja themed ones are like the dog, the dragon, and the ninja man. Everything else is just random. Yeah, no. Like mm-hmm. that was the thing. Like I don't I don't know what was going on and like Ninja Steels just seems to be like they sort of knew they were done because from what it seems like, and this is what's been coming out of not just Power Morph Con and not just Toy Fair, was that Savon was already secretly shopping around, and most general consumers or, uh, you know, business bureaus didn't know about it just yet, so it wasn't in the press until, like, Super Toy Ninja Fair. Steel. Yeah, on to- Toy Fair last Toy year or whatever. Year. Like, like, no one really knew what was going on until Toy Fair last year. You like, know what I think happened? There's one factor we've left out of this discussion. What? Power Rangers successfully released and failed a large-budget Hollywood movie. I mean, yeah. garbage. The 2017 Power Rangers movie, we're not even talking, we're not talking about quality of movie because that's a topic for another day. From a business standpoint, it was mm-hmm. poorly marketed. From a toy standpoint, it was poorly produced because the toys were not good. And from a box office sense, it was released at the wrong time of the year, in the wrong time slot, and it bombed. That movie did not make back its budget. No matter how much you see, look at the box office number matching the budget number, that does not make break even because anything done in marketing and additional distribution, that does not include with the production budget of a film. So that means that Power Rangers probably need to make another $100 million or $150 million to break even. Because, oh yeah, the Krispy Kreme sponsorship wasn't until after they filmed the movie. They didn't plan that ahead of time, so Krispy Kreme didn't give movie to the budget, didn't give money to the movie to help with the budget. So the thing is, is that what you have is you have Haim Saban, who we already know cares about money more than anything. He is a businessman first, a creative inspirer second. And he's looking at, okay, so Nickelodeon's ratings have been dropping for Power Rangers. Toy sales have been dropping from Bandai. The movie's toy line is sitting on shelves months after release, not going anywhere, even on sale. The movie bombed. It did okay in home video sales, but not enough to make up for that theatrical bomb. And now the franchise is sitting here, and we have Bandai contract coming up, ending soon. We have a Nickelodeon contract, ending soon. And that is where I think Saban probably decided, I'm going to go talk to my friend Brian Goldner, who works at Hasbro, because I think I want to sell this franchise, because I can make more money selling it than keeping it around. Yeah, no, because... I think with, with Super Ninja Steel, it, it, it's a mess. It, it's it's one of the biggest messes. The movie flop, and wasn't it that uh, we found out just because of the book that you have, the recent book, the Visual mm-hmm. History, that it kind of rumors that Saban took away part of the budget from Ninja Steel just to make that movie. Yeah, apparently uh, Ninja Steel's seasons lost a budget chunk because they want because again Saban doesn't put more of his own money into things. He only just sequesters around what's there. Uh, essentially that the budget for Ninja Steel was lower because they were putting more money into the movie's marketing. And so basically, instead of having a marketing budget for the film, they took the money from Ninja Steel and put it into the film marketing, which then restricted Ninja Steel. Apparently, this is just hearsay that's going around the internet, but it does have some credibility. The reason why the actors didn't do as many physical stunts and the reason why they create the ninja outfits that would hide their faces easily was because they didn't have the uh, the medical professionals on set that they would have normally had in case an actor got injured, which would then prevent them from doing any stunts. All right. No, because, like, when I look at a lot of the issues, everyone tries to blame it also on Nickelodeon's, like, episode counts. And I don't – like, I do think those That's did not the, the issue. Show. But I don't think directly it was the reason. I don't think it was directly by all means that reason. Uh, let me let me make let me no make sense. my note on this. Episode counts do not matter for a TV show, no matter what it is, because if your episode count is twenty episodes a season, you write your show for twenty episodes a season. You don't try to write more than that. Part of the problem, but the thing is with Megaforce, they cut out Mecha, they cut out villains. They slimmed it down to make it 20 episodes. The thing is, though, is they still kept all three villain groups, and they kept a lot more characters than they probably needed. They could have slimmed that out even further and made more consistent 20 episodes. Ninja Steel was splitting the Ninja stuff between two seasons. 
which was relatively okay. But I think uh, mixing up the order of villains made episodes weird because sometimes you'd have episodes they were adapting where the Six Ranger wasn't there. Same thing with Super Megaphor, same thing with Dino Supercharge. Or you just had episodes where they'd have to give a reason to get the Sixth Ranger out of there because they're using footage from another point in the Sentai season. The thing is, is that regardless of how many episodes they get, if they write for that number of episodes and not try to do it like they're doing a 36 or 32 to 40 episode season, then they're fine. But the problem is, is that they're not, they seemingly weren't writing for the scale of episodes that they were provided. Yeah, because other than that, I, I don't know what else we can really say. Like, Metal, what are your other thoughts on the whole prospect of, what, almost six to eight years? Like Eight years. It, eight, it is eight, right? Oh, yeah, it was. By the that end was eight of it. long years. No, but like, what 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 thoughts do you have to say about it? Because like, I don't think like as me and Santa said, it's not the network. It wasn't the the weird hiatuses and dates. I think it was just that they didn't budget it. Like it all, yeah. I feel like it all feel feel the Bandai and Saban. Yeah, like uh, I will say, like the whole uh, you know episode counting hiatuses certainly don't help. <laughs> Let's just say, especially when it comes to ratings uh, and the hiatuses. But when it comes down to it, yeah, it was the production. Like, it, it wasn't the network. It was because the money wasn't there. They funneled it into, you know, a big budget, you know, Hollywood movie that flopped, you know, into a toy line that that flopped, even though it had some interesting ideas, you know, with the individual Zords kind of, you know, forming together to form a large, you know, a very large Megazord was an interesting idea. But with the way they designed it, it just didn't work. Yeah, you could kind of see see it in... uh in Ninja Steel, you know, like I said, like uh, Soundart said, like the lack of stunts because they didn't have like the EMTs on set. I know the writing quality uh, definitely took a dip in the second season. And I know a lot of people, you know, pick out the over-reliance on, you know, potty humor when it comes to, you know, Monty. As a side note with the writing thing, as mm-hmm. someone that's that's worked in film production, the worst thing you can do to a writer on a film production is give them too little of a timeline to write an episode and why we kept going back to potty humor and some other stuff may just because they didn't have the time because they weren't getting being paid to have the time to produce quality supposedly stuff. when talking though also to victor and monty's actor as well as judd lynn they said it was like stuff that saban and the other producers at the you know that saban's inner circle likes and that's why they Maybe. voted more into the show. <laughs> Maybe. Very likely. Like, Judd, Judd, Producers Judd have a lot of pull in a TV show. I was going to say, maybe old Hyam's a lot like Vince McMahon. He he really enjoys potty humor for some reason. Yeah, no, so. like supposedly what Judd said to me and what uh, I think – it was either Judd or, what, like I said, Caleb or one of them said was that like the like inner circle, like while, while some of it – they even stated some of it was funny for like juvenile like ch- children – but they also stated, comparing it to older shows, it never got that, in a sense, juvenile. I have know? another thing. Here's a random theory I'm just going to throw out there. Uh, Haim Saban, I think, is one of those uh, those producers that has a jealousy streak, uh, because it seems like sometimes he wants his thing to be as something else. So he might have looked at Nickelodeon's ratings, saw that shows with toilet humor were per- outperforming Power Rangers, and decided, oh yeah, that's what we need in Power Rangers more. That'll make it more successful. It's probably also the case. Yeah, the show called Teen Titans Go is outperforming us. We need more. Puppy not the same. Ch- not the same channel. I not know, the same was, channel, but that well, could be I behind the I was just throwing mentality. it out there as like a. It's a idea. very likely thing because part of the reason why the show didn't perform in Nickelodeon is because Nickelodeon used to air Samurai a lot, but it wasn't really performing, so they cut back how many times they aired Power Rangers a week. They stopped doing Power Rangers reruns because it wasn't making them any money. So they're like, we could fill our slots with other things. So, yeah, so we'll banish it to, like, you know, Saturdays and then maybe, like, one rerun and then, like, that's it. There's actually quite a few reruns. It's just, like, really poorly timed. Well, yeah, they're not in, like, high traffic, you know, times. You know, like, they're, like, usually banished either, what is it, to, like, the very early morning or, like, very late at night. When it's usually only on weekends, too. It's, you know... Yeah. 
when their target demographic is probably, you know, out doing stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, also, there's one thing I want to bring up quickly about uh, Bandai America that we don't want to also forget, too, before we jump over to New York Toy Fair news to wrap up our show, is one of the biggest things that people tend to overlook is the legacy line. While they tried to do a lot of cool and interesting things, one of their biggest problems was they took too long on actually executing and producing product that people either wanted or they said they were going to deliver upon. When it came to the Legacy Morphers, it took them forever just to come out with the Ninja Coins. It took them forever just to come out with the stupid movie variants that people sort of were asking for. It took them a while to come out with Dragon Zord. It took them a while to come out with Titanus. It took them a while to come out with the Thunder Zord. And like some of their excuses were validated by saying, we were having troubles with the engineering of the Thunder Zords, which still seemed like they had enough time to do it, but yet they kind of came out pseudo good, sort of 50-50 in some regards. But it was just like one of those things was like, they said they were doing it, but they seemed to never really actually be working on it. So when we finally got it, we had like these half-ass moments, and it was like really stupid, you know what I'm saying? Was that if you're making a collector's line, how do you fuck up a collector's line? Here's the and thing. Then, and then I you think. stop and you look at Mattel. Okay, yeah, we're not going to bring Mattel up because they obviously do collector's lines. Actually, no. Mattel does things a little bit better than Bandai. And you know why? I'm going to say it. So Bandai of America's Legacy line had this wonderful little hiccup that happened called Nine Months Without Product. It's the same hiccup Mattel just went through, except it was 13 months. But the thing is, is that when you leave enough gap in time between releases, and you don't show much new in between, the hype for the line and the momentum dies. And then people start looking, wait, do I actually want these figures? Because that's what happened to me. I was all on board for the legacy figures. I was buying all of them. I was keeping up. And then they stopped, and I was like, okay, but all right, this has this issue. This has that issue. Oh, look, Hasbro just revealed a bunch of Marvel Legends I'd rather buy. And then I stopped buying the legacy figures because they gave me nine months to think about it too much. And that was the issue with Legacy Line in general, I think, is they gave people time to think too much. And I think they also gave other companies time to innovate while they're just waiting around for stock to clear, which was their excuse, which is not usually how that goes. That's why you have an online presence. So that's not an issue. I think with Legacy, the other issue they had was they blew their MMPR load in the first three waves. Because after that point, most of the market didn't care anymore. The fact of the matter is, is that the thing that Legacy, that collect, that got Legacy started was MMPR. Uh, them putting out all the MMPR Rangers as fast as they could, got them a bunch of money up front, but no one stuck around at that point because the only people left were the hardcore Power Rangers fans. And even they had died off because of quality issues. So that's why I think Legacy failed. Uh, I don't think it's because they packed, you know, they made female figures. That wasn't the issue. The problem is that they didn't make female figures that properly represented females. The male figures were over buff. The build of figures didn't look like they were worth the extra sacrifice of the weapons. The $20 price point didn't seem worth it, and the scale was off. They were too big to fit with multi DC Multiverse, they are too big to fit with Marvel Legends, and when it comes to 6-inch collector figures, people like it when you can fit figures together that are from different lines in a similar scale. Not necessarily exact, but similar. I was the thing is, Legacy were too big. That Legacy, when it came to the earlier stuff, when it was just supposed to be more Morphers and Megazords, they were just still like, well, you gotta wait till next year for the next Morpher, or the next weapon, or the next Zord. And it was like, why are you taking so long? And like, the only excuse was the Thunder Megazords engineering. Nothing else made any sense as to why it took they, forever. Yeah, they started Legacy in 2010, and by 2018, they had released... A total of, let's see, we got Dino Megazord, Dragon Zord, Titanus, Thunder Megazord, White Tiger Zord, Ninja Megazord, and the Falcon Zord. So that was a total of seven Megazords in eight years, with a couple red, uh, black and gold variants that were thrown in. But in eight years, they only got seven Megazords out. And that's horrible. The fact is, too, with Morphers, if we exclude the, mor- the, the repaints of the Dino Morpher, they only did two Morphers. The Power Morpher and the Xeonizer. And the Xeonizer had stupid kitty voices that seemed like they belonged in one of the basic toys and not a collector's piece, uh, especially when it didn't have a normal morph sound. Which like, it was killed. funny. They could get back Tony Oliver, but they couldn't just pay the five actors to come back and just do Zero Ranger 5 Red, Zero Ranger 2 Yellow. It's like, you that dumb. And then on top of that, there was no way to turn those voices off. Yeah, that was actually another thing I heard. 
is one yeah, of the you, biggest problems. That's the, that, that turned me off. I'm like, this thing's a hundred bucks and you can't turn off the voices to just have a morph sound? No, I'm not going to buy it. They did some good stuff, I think, in the weapons. I think the weapons were probably the strongest part of the Legacy line. Those turned out really good. I can't complain about those. And let's move on to the g- good things in life before we have to wrap up, since we want to get this episode, you know, under an let's hour. Let's talk about the hour, future. 30. So New York Toy Fair, as you obviously know, did occur this past weekend as we're recording, even though we're, you know, airing a week later, just due to how we, you know, do things. Just here. roll with it, guys. Yeah, yeah just, just deal with it. Shh. Just pretend, just pretend. So fast forward a year where Hasbro has now not only gained the master toy license of the Power Rangers brand from Bandai, but they've also purchased the entire franchise from Saban Brands. Hasbro is in charge of everything. Even though we do know leading into Beast Morphers, it's going to be run like the Wild Force production where Saban It's going to be a split production because there's people from Saban that are working for Hasbro to produce the series because Hasbro throwing in a brand new team of people is not going to get that season delivered on time. The thing is, though, is we do know that the Beast Morphers filming schedule is running longer than usual, uh, and the actors have been given weekends off because I see them on Instagram taking day trips on the weekend to spots around New Zealand, which I never saw a Power Rangers cast do before. Yeah, so with that... So that's reassuring. We, we probably have a better uh, show coming for us. But when it came to the toys, before New York Toy Fair even aired, they were putting up production... Not production, but official gallery images for our Megazords, our roleplay, our weapons. And uh, if you've watched some of the figures, but not all the figures, because we had to wait till the actual event to see our, you know, base figures of of the Lightning Collection, of the retail toys. But we didn't get really good close-ups until the day of the event. Now, if you did watch Ninja Talks, Tokusatsu, me and Invisible Ninja did talk about the original leaks for, I think, the Mechas and the... Uh, role play, right? Visible Ninja, we did talk about weapons and role play? We did, yes. Okay. So, quickly, so me and, uh, Metal can give our thoughts quickly on that for, point before we go into the full unveil of the, the toy fair and then we'll let sound out go is, uh, when it came to the weapons, the, I'll say this quick, when it came to the exclusive stuff, like the new ones, like the Cheetah Blaster and Sword, they did look fairly cool, but they didn't look entirely great. Like, they feel a little cheap, but because it feels like they were rushed, However, like, seeing the Sogon blade with the little blue effect made it look actually like an actual blade compared to, you know, its Japanese counterpart, and it looked really hefty, and it looks like an item that you would want to buy. Uh, seeing the electronic figure and the actual deluxe toys, they look good, slimmed down, scaled down, and having the actual points of articulation and transformation features, as well as, you know, sort of following suit with Playmates' Voltron style. Like, I'm not too enthusiastic about it, but it at least There's works. no other way to do gonna, it. Yeah, I guess it's no other there way to do no it. There is no other way to do it. Because coming from somebody that owns, like, the main five Go Busters mecha, which is what we're seeing the Hasbro versions of here, those things are huge. Like, compared to other Sentai mecha, like, this is not like, oh, you have to buy the gorilla separately, and it's like, oh, it's like Cube Gorilla, who's, like, four inches tall. No, this is like, you know, GT-02 Gorilla, who's, like, six inches tall and really chunky. And they all have multiple, mo- like, two, at least two modes each, so there's no reason that they couldn't sell them on their own. Uh, I think combining them only in box sets would have made them uh, price themselves out of the market, I think, because as of right now, we're looking at it's going to be, I think, 80 bucks for the Beast X Megazord, which that's not bad considering, you know, the Japanese version, the Japanese pricing, the fact that these all have paint apps and all their modes. This is Bandai of America. They were going to try to cram it to a $35 box. They would have been really small, out of proportion. Uh, they wouldn't have had all the paint details, and they may not have had uh, some of their modes. They may have had vehicle or animal, but not both. And so the thing is, is that Hasbro has taken the opportunity to say, hey, these are already transforming robots each on their own. We already do transforming robots really well over at Transformers. So there's really no reason why they can't sell them on their own. And they can. And from what I can tell based on just inferring based on the size of the display, these should be around the size of the Japanese counterparts. All right, and yeah, Metal, your first, uh, your just brief thoughts on the original previews that we talked about on your show before we got okay, to the actual I'll just go toy display. Quick, yeah. Like I said, the original to- uh, the original weapons, like, eh, you know, we we always get those. The Cheetah Blaster is kind of interesting because apparently will be used in show, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, the blade is definitely a lot more healthy. It looks awesome. The Megazords, like I said, actually do look interesting because they've actually changed like how Go Buster Ace's feet work. 
So he has like actual feet. In addition, he has more articulation, which is interesting. He has and a I waist swivel. Yeah, he has a waist swivel. And I also do agree with Sound Out is this is kind of the only way they could have done it, you know, because they're decently sized. They have all their paint apps. They have their vehicle mode animal mode then you know combining together blue is also interesting because it's based on the suit as opposed to like the japanese toy since he's actually since you know the ape is actually you know standing upright as opposed to the toy which is a lot more like an actual gorilla you know like walking on his knuckles so that's actually kind of interesting and in all i actually am really looking forward to uh the beast x megazord all right i'm buying them and i have the japanese ones let's go now into our actual you know toy display with the stuff we got and the actual Im- images for our lightning collection will uh, go, I guess, right, right, right into the display. We have all the stuff we talked about with the promotional images, but now we have actual real close-up of the Zords. We have the close-up of our actual basic figures, our deluxe 12-inch figures, our lightning collection, and we also got to know that we have more confirmation that the character of Escape is now Roxy. Messiah is now called Evox, and honestly... The only thing that could have hurt the display, the the Lightning Collection and the regular collection of the Shadow Ranger, Lord Zed, uh, White Ranger, uh, Goldar, you know, Beast Monster Red, and Dino Charge Red, was just whoever the hell was posing those figures. Like, they... They've never posed a figure in their life, but okay, overall, I have a theory. Incredible. I have a theory. The Shadow Ranger, in particular, he's just like falling backwards because his feet are tacked down on that base. I've been tacking down figures lately, and if their hips are loose, they're just gonna fall wherever the hell they are. Like that looks exactly like uh my Star Wars Black Series Qui Gon Jinn because his hips got loose, so he's just like tipping backwards while his feet are like solid, like he's not going anywhere. He's just falling backwards. And all I can say is like the displays of the figures made them look a lot better. They stand out way more than the official galleries in some regards. And I really did like a lot of the new changes. Uh, I'm gonna let Metal go first, sound out, and then you can go, and then I'll go, and yada yada yada. Yeah, rotating, y- yay. Yada yada yay. Uh, but yeah, those uh mainline figures for Beast Morphers look pretty damn sexy. I do admit, you know, despite being you know the mainline kind of figures, they honestly look pretty. Like the detailing looks pretty awesome. The fact is, they're gonna come with at least two weapons. I know it's gonna you know vary based on you know which one it is, but it's actually kind of cool that they. It seems like that they're gonna get. You know, the, the blade basically, and then, you know, uh, another weapon like the Cheetah Blaster, the Ichigan Buster, and like the, the special version with the combined that they, you know, use in Japan or whatever. And then there's the whole thing with Cyber Villain Blaze being very heavily, you know, featured. So that's actually going to be kind of cool since the Dark Buster suit, yeah, the whole Dark Buster thing was kind of criminally underused in Go Busters. You know, since it was only, like, in the last, like, two episodes, like, two or three episodes that it featured it. And then, yeah, we're going to ha- ha- have a lot more escapes, uh, you know, a lot more, you know, of a uh, messiah. So that's actually going to be really awesome. But obviously the big thing is the morpher. So, yeah, <laughs> Bandai be like, oh, but there's no collectible gimmick. Hasbro, well, we'll make one. Like, I, I kind of do like the idea of the Morphex keys, especially how they kind of double as, like, a third weapon for all the figures since they all come with one. And kind of how they work with the Morphers is interesting, too, because, like, each one will trigger, like, different sounds in the Morpher. And then the Morpher itself is actually both motion-activated, because, like, if you swing it around, it'll, like, do attack noises, which will apparently be different depending which key's in there. And then it's actually voice activated since you actually have to yell its morphing time at it to, to trigger the sequence. So that is actually pretty damn baller. Like something like like if like if this was Bandai, like they it, it would probably just have like the the whole visor spring up thing and then just make a couple sounds and it would be like twenty bucks and like garbage. But no, Hasbro it seems like they're actually putting some stuff into it since they actually kind of pulled a collectible gimmick you know wholesale out of their asses. So, and those lightning collection figures, like they, they are just supremely sexy. They definitely look on par with, you know, uh, Marvel Legends. The detailing's awesome. They come with, you know, effect pieces. There's going to be unmasked heads, especially for Shadow Ranger. That, that's going to be awesome because, you know, we get the doggy Kruger head, which is 
Sweet. You know, when they make Solaris Knight, I'm going to put the Solaris Knight head on, on, on Shadow Ranger. <laughs> I'm going to put the John Tui head actually on Shadow Ranger and be like, fuck y'all. He ain't no dog. Yeah, but like I said, it's all, it like, it's all just completely, utterly amazing. That's about all I can really all say right, about sound it. out your load to blow. Okay, so when we were at Morphicon, I was getting this, like, really big sense of hope from Hasbro, and there was a really good feeling in the room during their panel. And now I'm seeing the realization of that hope and that I wasn't just blindly putting faith in Hasbro because this is some really great stuff. Things I want to know, uh, Dark Buster is in the basic line. He's in the 12-inch line. He's got his own sounds in the Morpher. There's a line of dialogue in the Morpher that says, I'm the better Red Ranger. So this is really saying to me, especially with some other things that have leaked out, he's going to be like our main villain of the series. He's going to be there the whole time. And that already shifts the dynamic of Go Busters completely and makes me very excited. There's also a dark version of the Cheetah Blaster, which totally needs to be made into a toy because it looks awesome in black. All right. Uh, basic figures look fantastic. I'm probably going to pick up all these. I like that the buddy roids are in a slightly higher price point. So that allows like Cheetah Nick to be transformable, allows Gorosaki to be bigger. You know, Escape is there, which is awesome. The keys are great. The little micro figures in the blind bags look cool, too. Uh, I'm liking how they're not just getting the same exact product Bandai of America used to put out. Uh, as for the Morpher, I'm probably going to end up buying it since I'm planning to get all the figures anyways. I might as well get the Morpher to go with it. Uh, lots of cool sounds, lots of cool features. They really spruced up the Morph Brace. The Morph Brace was not too exciting of a toy, uh, and they really they really took it the next step. Um, and Play School Heroes, too. Give the credit there. There's a ton of seasons represented in that initial lineup, and that's really awesome. Uh, moving on to Lightning Collection, I'm a big Marvel Legends collector, a big Star Wars Black Series collector. The Lightning Collection is essentially what would happen is if a company that knew how to make six-inch action figures was making six-inch Power Rangers figures. Uh, there is so much to unpack here. I could probably do a whole podcast on it, but things I've noticed in particular... Uh, Lord Zed has butterfly soul shoulders, which I didn't expect. Uh, and then I noticed once he had them that I checked all the other Ranger figures and they all have butterfly shoulders. So they have that additional shoulder movement that only some Marvel Legends have and like no Black Series have. So that's already a great sign. Uh, I love the unmasked heads. I wasn't expecting one for Kruger. I figured, oh, it's going to be the ones for Rangers we've seen without their helmets or something, but no, it's everybody, uh, which means like stuff like Magna Defender should have a civilian head. I like the effect parts. They really add to it. The Cheetah Blaster comes with the Beast Morphers Red Ranger, which means that should be in the series as well, uh, which is cool because that's a new weapon. Uh, the Goldar looks fantastic. I've already pre-ordered him, uh, along with the rest of Wave 1. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of these. I'm not sure what the effect part on the White Ranger is. It's kind of like this weird little blue burst on the end of Saba, and I don't really know what that's supposed to represent. That's probably the vaguest effect part I've ever seen in my life. But other than that, yeah, fantastic stuff. Like, the fact that the, the figures are so detailed, you get down into looking at it, and it's like, oh, wow, there's wrinkles and folds in the sculpt of the costumes. So that, yeah. No, these things are meant to look exactly like the series. They're not like a stylized interpretation. They're a recreation of what we see on screen. And that is all I could ask for from a Power Rangers figure. All right, with me, I'm, I'm going to try to just run it down as fast as possible. All right, so your basic figures, they look incredible. They have amazing points of articulation. The fact that they're going to incorporate the actual key gimmick with the figures and make them actual weapons, smart move. And I see that they're borrowing a lot of their ideas from the Yokai Watch toy line and actually executing it perfectly for Power Rangers. It works great. It's a smart idea with the chips and stuff and yada, yada, yada. Uh, what I do like is the fact that we are getting, you know, Dark Buster real fast, which seems to be possibly in wave one we're also supposedly getting you know roxy which is escape in wave one we're also getting evox messiah allegedly in uh, at least wave one which i'm just assuming we have gold and silver which i guess they were trying to hide them in the in the lineup because they're either in the back of the lineups and whatnot uh one thing i really do love was the enthusiasm from misake ayame when she found out that she was getting a figure technically in Power Rangers, she was happy, she was retweeting people, she was having conversations with her fans, whether they were English, French, Spanish, and she's trying to learn like five different languages. And that was like great on social media. So she's happy, we're happy, I'm happy. And uh, when it comes to the Mecca, it's great, I want them. I 
really think we have a lot of cool points of articulation. And then with the Lightning Collection, I like practically all that I saw. I only pre-ordered Lord Zed and Shadow Ranger at this time. I'm probably going to pre-order Goldar eventually. I, I had a few joking nitpicks, like Lord Zed's uh, fingernails aren't as protruding nor painted in as silver. They're, like, not jagged or, or painted in, which I was like, when I saw the figure, I was, like, wondering why why something looked awkward. And I was like, oh, it's it's his fingers. They're not the, you know, weird naily silver chromed out like the rest of his body. And then with Goldar, I, I have this weird nitpick that a lot of people don't know about, but I personally don't like the American uh, retool for the Goldar suit from, uh you know, season two onwards, except when he's alongside Rito. Like, when he's not with Rito... I prefer, like, the Zhu, uh, suit. Like, I prefer the Zhu Ranger suit, or even the early American suit that didn't have to reconstruct his entire, uh, facial sculpt. I don't know why, I just really like, it, it looks a little bit more slimmer, I think. Even though it's a taller suit, it feels a little bit more slimmer. It feels a little bit robust in some areas where the season two suit, I feel like the head's a little bit too big. I feel like his, his jawline, because of the animatronics for it, are bigger. I feel like his body's a little bit more squatty and, and shorter. And I think the only reason I, you know, in a sense, like the American Goldar suit is only when it's with Rito. And it's also because, at that time, the character got significantly dumber. So, like, that's for me, like, my weird nitpicks were, like, the Rangers looked fine. The villains were, like, I was, like, no, I want my villains, like, nailed right on the head, kind of. But I'm still probably going to get them anyways. And, and that, and all I can say is the best part about the Lightning Collection is how it's like one, not, not just a huge middle finger to Bandai America, but they straight up were giving a middle finger to Tamashi Nations. They were like, hey guys, look at these incredible box arts. Do these remind you of anything? Figure arts? Huh. Hey, Bandai Japan, how you doing, sucker? They're better looking than figure arts. Yeah, I know, as you come in all moochie with, like, broken up audio to try to whisper it. But no, like, it was just hilarious. Like, they were just, like, giving them one huge middle finger, and I was just laughing. Because I'm just sitting here going, so eventually that means they're going to do a big middle finger to Bandai even further by giving us the Psycho Rangers, like, by wave three or four. I think Psycho Rangers are at least a year out because they need to... Because the thing that somebody noted to me, outside of MMPR, they're not touching any seasons that Bandai did in Legacy. Maybe. Because the, first, like, the first two waves, if the rest of the Amazon listings are correct, which at this point they are, uh, there's they haven't touched... They're not touching any of the seasons that Bandai touched recently, and that's good for retailer uh, support because then it's like, oh yeah, no, we're not just remaking the same thing that you just had recently. We're making something new. Well, here's the thing that I feel like, though, is I feel like they should at least do only the Psychos, only because we didn't get the full team. Like, if it's not a full team, they should just try to sneak those out, like, ones that I they think, know the fans. I think they're probably going to do them one at a time, like, they're well, you doing know, no, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying, like, I'm, what I'm not trying to say is, like, all at once, but I'm saying is they should be, like, saying, no, we do, like, you know, in the er first early waves, there should be, like, a, a little... Hey, we got you. We got you. You know what I'm saying? Psycho Pink comes out wave three, yeah, and then yeah. everyone loses their minds. Yeah, but you, but you get what I'm trying to say is that yeah. with the whole outcry with at least the Psycho Rangers mostly, they should first rectify Bandai's mistakes. Even though some of these figures may be duplicates, try to rectify some of the mistakes because people are pissed about No Space Silver. People are pissed about that. People were pissed that the Zeo Rangers were... You know, for the girls, they were short, short packed and GameStop exclusives. And I'm, and, and this is the thing is, I get that you don't want to just do it because it could hurt your overall sales with also the retailers, but I feel like you should try to make it up to them. And here's the thing with Hasbro Pulse being their in, their in company thing, just make it an online exclusive that's still massively sold through Hasbro Pulse or GameStop stores. Like, make it that it's, like, it's not just a store exclusive where it's really, really limited, but it's, like, here, we'll make it just an online retailer. So you just get it at BBTS, you get it at, at Entertainment Earth, you get it at GameStop, you get it at Hasbro Pulse. We're just going to release Zeo in space, Dino Thunder, your Psycho Rangers, there. And then that would help them out better because at least they don't have to worry about the, the retail stores bitching and complaining, oh, we just had these five effing figures coming up our shelves. You just put them out on, on internet and then later redistribute them in a reissue wave, like, you know, 
at a regular retail. There's another thing is I, I think that, um. Cause we're also missing the Thunder Rangers. This is true. Uh, I think with, with, uh, with Hasbro, they have a lot more resources into that expanded market than Bandai did, uh, where Bandai couldn't really, uh, comp, well, like, they, they didn't try hard enough either, but, um, they didn't get any Walmart Target exclusives. Uh, the GameStop exclusives were only figures that were originally supposed to be in waves anyways. Hasbro's like, okay, GameStop, we're gonna distribute our stuff to you. Here's an exclusive figure. They're probably gonna say, Target, here's an exclusive figure. It all depends on whether Walmart or Target are going to pick up Hasbro Power Rangers stuff. We're not sure that's happened yet, uh, simply because right now, neither store has Power Rangers toys. The thing that I do know is that with Hasbro, when it comes to Black Series and Marvel Legends, they throw out a lot of characters exclusive to stores. Not just variants to other exclusives, but certain characters. For example, uh, they did the Fantastic Four at Walgreens. That was a set of four that was released over the course of two years. The uh, other characters come in multi-packs, where it's like, here's a redo, here's a new character. There's a lot more options, I think, with Hasbro to produce the Lightning Collection, where it's not just, here's four figures a wave every quarter. Uh, where Bandai, it was like, here's five figures a wave, five figures a wave. Then they start shipping them, here's one of the five new figures, and then here's two of the five new figures, and, uh, you know, it just got really weird towards the end. But it's not going to be so linear, it's just, here's the waves. And the waves will probably expand. It took uh, Star Wars two years in Black Series to go from four figures or less to six figures or less uh, per wave. Um, and now we're just getting six-figure waves for Star Wars. So I think things will build up over time as uh, hopefully sales grow and things are going. And things are good because the the uh, toy collecting market has now noticed these figures and said, hey, I like that dog face dude. I might get him even though I don't know what season he's from. And that's the best thing that can happen for the Power Rangers franchise. All right, Santa. No, I think what you just said is the best way to wrap up this episode for now. Uh, if we have any more we want to talk about just about the Lightning Collection or more in depth about the toys, we can do that next week at the start of our show with a little bit of news that we've missed this week only because there is more Toy Fair stuff we did want to talk about on this episode, but we did run a little bit longer than we expected because we wanted this episode to be a little bit shorter than what we've done in the last week or two of episodes. Anyways, uh, to start wrapping us up, Visible Ninja, please uh, give your nice shillings and plugs for our audience. Shill, shill, plug, plug, shill, shill, plug, plug. Anyways, follow me on social media at Visible Ninja Zero. I don't tweet terribly interesting stuff, but sometimes I go crazy and you you might be in for a show. Otherwise, uh, check out my YouTube channel at Visible Ninja Dojo, where I usually host my two live shows a week. Mondays starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, which is the Gundam show, and then Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, which is the Tokusatsu show. And of course, you know, check out HeroClub.com and the Hero Club Twitch, which is where they also stream at uh, twitch.tv slash Hero Club for life. All right. Sound out. Uh, check out me on Twitter at SoundOut12. YouTube is also SoundOut12. Uh, I do, I do Toku stuff a lot ish. Right now, I'm looking at Solo Chagok and Die Rugger and losing my mind a little bit because I don't know how I can afford Power Rangers toys and this, but I'm going to pull it off somehow, probably with a pyramid scheme. All right. I am Wheelchair 21. You can find me on YouTube and Twitter and I think Facebook at Wheelchair 21. My Instagram is Taja underscore Doyle. I do a lot of Tokusatsu reviews. I like doing mini plot. I like doing figure arts at this time. However, I do on occasion do Power Rangers when I'm actually enthusiastic and interested in it, seeing that, you know, actually Beast Morphers and the Lightning Collection looks actually better than how I had to do a lot of the Dino Charge stuff in more groupings and hoardings, I can maybe start doing more, in a sense, wave-like figure reviews and not be so out of the effing loop, since there's so many more avenues to actually purchase these toys now, like from Hasbro Pulse. Go check them out if you haven't and already done so. And all retailers... All of them. Well, yeah, all retailers, but I'm saying that Hasbro Pulse is a bit of a better stipulation than Bandai just going, we don't know what an online store is. And uh, that concludes our postmortem for Neo Saban era. Good as well riddance. As, they weren't the best for this franchise. As well as Bandai of America. 
And like I said, we'll probably, if we have any more we want to talk about, we will talk about it a little bit more on next week's episode when we do address a few more things from New York Toy Fair that we wanted to talk about on this episode, but we ran too long. And uh, we'll see you all hopefully next week with a brand new episode of Los Inglonables de Tokusatsu, as I forgot what our planned episode was for 77. Anyways, we'll see you all next time. Hey, it's Wheelchair21, and thanks again for listening to an all-new episode of Los Inglonables de Tokusatsu. If you want to hear more content or see more content from the Hero Club YouTube channel, we're going to need you to subscribe, like, comment with some feedback, and share this channel with a friend. We also would like you to check out our website, hero-club.com, and follow us on various social media outlets just by looking up Hero Club for Life, as well as the stores you see are where we shop. Anyways, thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.